Hi everyone, this is the last lecture on chapter 22. Today we're going to be talking about using microorganisms in food and to make things we need. So when we talk about microorganisms and making food, we also need to talk about the role that they play in spoilage of food too. So human food comes from another organism generally and it's rarely obtained in a sterile or uncontaminated state. So you can think about that either in vegetables and fruit or even in meat. That it is coming from a non-sterile environment or state. And food can become contaminated along the route of procurement. It can be contaminated during processing or preparation with microbes from soil, bodies of plants or animals, even from water, air, and food handlers or utensils. And in some cases, microbes can be added to food to obtain a desired effect, so a beneficial effect or beneficial in the sense of taste. So we'll kind of go through those. So when we're looking at it, let's start with the beneficial. Um, food can be fermented or otherwise chemically changed using microbes or microbial products and this can improve the flavor, taste, or texture. And microbes can also serve as food. Sorry, I missed a V there. And then detrimental effects. Microbes cause food poisoning. We know this that there are bacteria that can cause food poisoning. They can also cause foodborne illness and they can also spoil food. And then there are cases where the presence of microbes would be neutral, so would not cause disease or change the nature of the food. So as long as food contains no harmful substances or organisms, it's suitable for consumption. And so it's m largely a, a matter of taste of whether or not something tastes good that you would want to eat it. So the test of whether certain foods are edible is often guided by culture. Different cultures find different flavors to be enjoyable. It's also guided by experience and preference. So the flavors and colors and textures and even the smells of many uh, cultural delicacies are actually supplied by bacteria or fungi that have been added. So it may be something that maybe you don't like but in another culture would be uh, a delicacy and it's just by generally speaking that experience and preference. So some that would be good examples of this are poi, pickled cabbage, Norwegian fermented fish, and Limburger cheese. These are all very strong smelling, tasting um, textures that are very popular in certain cultures but may not be in a particular culture. So most of the flavor then of these cultures, or excuse me, of these foods get their delicious flavor from microbes. Microbes are what prov are providing those flavors. So food fermentation is a good example of this. And many culinary procedures, we actually add microbes to the food and encourage them to grow. And this is true in bread. We have yeast that helps bread rise, cheese, beer, wine, and yogurt we see with fermentation and pickles. So these reactions actually encourage that biochemical activity because that's what gives it the taste or the smell or the appearance in the food that we like or that makes it really what it is. And these microbes can be occurring naturally on the food substrate or they can be added as a pure mixed sample of a known bacteria, mold or yeast. So many of you have probably had sourdough pancakes. You've probably heard the term starter culture and this is the starter culture to continue that process. It adds added to food substrate to continue the process. So many of the food fermentations are synergistic and what that means is that these microbes act in a way that convert that starting substance to that desired end product. So it's actually that microbes acting on it that convert it to what we want the product to be. And large-scale production happens with fermented milk, cheese, bread, alcoholic brews, and vinegar. And these can be done in a large-scale production so that we have a large amount of these. And a lot of effort is spent 
selecting and maintaining and preparing these cultures so that we don't have contaminants, especially in a large scale production. And then most of the materials that we start with are raw and they're of either a plant or animal origin, although generally speaking it's plants. We have grains, for example, when we look at alcoholic brews or breads, vegetables when we're looking at pickling or vinegar additions, and beans. These are all things for fermentation. It is true that we do do some with animal origin and those would be with milk and meat. So that's kind of going over the food. We also have a use of microorganisms to make things that we need. And there has been a real push in industrial microbiology. And so these are large scale commercial enterprises that use microorganisms to manufacture consumable materials. So very large scale because you think of how small the microorganisms are, how big of a scale and what this would take. So we do bulk production of many organic compounds and these include antibiotics, hormones, vitamins, acids, solvents, and enzymes. And the processing steps that are involved involve fermentation similar to those in food technology but we're talking about a much much larger scale so that they can produce this specific compound and they often involve many complex stages along the way in this production. So why are we doing these industrial microbiology? And mainly we're doing it because, for a number of reasons, but one is that we can produce chemicals that can be purified and packaged for sale or use in other chemical product, commercial products. And thousands of tons of organic chemicals are produced by this industry and it's worth billions of dollars. It's a very large business. And to create just one product, the industry has to determine which microbes and what compounds we have to start with, and then also the growth conditions that would work best to get the production going. And research and development of this takes 10 to 15 years and billions of dollars. So it's a very expensive and very time-consuming research and development, but the payoff is great. So the one that I find to be the most interesting, especially in this day and age, is the work that we're seeing on biofuels and trying to find alternative fuels. So there's a number of different ones we're looking at. One is the use of cyanobacteria and algae species with the hope that it would replace gasoline and jet fuel. So originally we looked at doing this from plants and the original ones were corn and soybeans to try to get, boy soy to get biofuel. But this proved to be very unpopular because what we were doing was we were taking these large amounts of land and growing plants that were not being used for food and that became unpopular. Whereas with algae we can grow a lot very quickly and vast it produces vast quantities of oil in a controlled manner. We can do it in a controlled area. And oil produced then would be biodegradable which is also a huge benefit. So lastly on biofuels, algae can produce oil when they're exposed to sunlight and they use photosynthesis to manufacture this oxygen and biomass and the biomass is lipids or oils. And many governments and private industries are investing a lot in researching these projects and on the hope that this technolo technology on a large scale would replace a significant amount of fossil fuel. So I find that to be one of the most interesting. In your book there is more information about pharmaceuticals and other chemicals that are being produced by microorganisms. I really think that biofuel is the one that uh, tends to be in the news the most and probably the most interesting to me. So that's the end of our lectures for chapter 22. I hope this helps.